All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the second of our career workshops today at uh, PNNL Emsel Auditorium. Um, I'm Janet Bryant. I'm a past chair of the section, and uh, having a lot of fun organizing this visit with uh, Dr. William Carroll. Bill Carroll um, did a workshop this morning for those of you. Some of you were in there this morning on, uh, on resume construction, and we're going to continue the discussion this afternoon uh, with a, an ACS Career Pathways workshop on uh, working in industry. So, you know, this workshop is going to explore the, the many and varied career paths and options in industry for chemical professionals in particular, and will focus on determining the goodness of fit between a job seeker and industry, finding a job, and then making a su successful application. It includes attention within the workshop to both traditional laboratory type of positions as well as other positions outside the lab where chemists can and have made a contribution to industry. We hope you'll discover the best way to find jobs in industry, manage the recruitment process, and more, most importantly for most of us, negotiate a good job offer. So that's the content of today's uh, session. Uh, I'll introduce you to Dr. Bill Carroll. Uh, Bill uh, is a past president of the American Chemical Society, past chair of the board of directors of ACS as well. Uh, he's got his PhD from Indiana University and is currently an adjunct professor of chemistry uh, there. He recently retired, happily retired, as vice president of industry issues for Occidental Chem Corporation. He looks really retired, doesn't he, guys, right? Uh, <laughs> uh, Bill is uh, currently on the ACS Board of Directors as a director at large. He is a proud fellow of AAAS and the Royal Society of Chemistry. He's a member of a number of committees for the National Research Council. Stop it, I gotta do this for everybody online. Oh, I gotta do this anyway, Bill. So anyway, the bottom line is, uh, Bill is a long-term friend of our Richland section who is proud to host the, uh, this workshop. He's going to give a really fun talk tomorrow, by the way, uh, from 4 to 6 back here. And if you haven't read about it online, go online and see, see the content. And I'll, I'll just tell you, it involves the cross between data analytics and the music industry. So be prepared to, to rock on a little bit and enjoys the interface between science and music. And uh, it's, a, it's a fun talk that Bill's been, been given around, uh, around the country. So um, after today's successful workshop, please do try to come back and, and hear that wonderful, um, wonderful talk. For those of you um, who um, would like, <clears throat> uh, and those of you who are online, if you go to acs.labworks.org slash calendar.html, if you are internal here at PNNL and can get to um, our current lab web page, there's a link uh, to the, uh, the Skype meeting as well as some downloadable files and reference materials uh, that will stay up until Monday. So if you want those files um, for your personal use, uh, please go online and download them. Also next week, since we will be recording the Skype session, uh, we will put up, right Nick, we'll put up the videos uh, effective next week at the same uh, calendar location, so you'll have some reference materials. So with that, I'm going to turn the floor over to Bill Carroll, and he will lead you through a very interactive session this afternoon about working in industry. Go get him, Bill. Thank you, Janet. Thanks very much. And I, I can't tell you how encouraging it is to me to see some of the same faces back for yet another dose of this uh, after having, uh, apparently, I, I didn't kill all of you this morning, so that, 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 that's really good news. So we're going to talk a little about working in industry. Uh, today, and I wanted to show you uh, uh, just a, a bit more about the totality of the Career Pathways workshops. So this is what this is what we do as as, as ACS. There is a workshop called Finding Your Path that is the basics in these four areas: working in higher education, industry, federal government, working for yourself. So there's a bit of all four of those in Finding Your Path. Then there are specific modules for these four. Now, in a way, you're kind of an experimental uh, group. Uh, but I don't have an internal review board on this. Um, working in industry, we have recently divided into this part, which is about industry and, 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 and employment in industry, and the part that you took this morning, which was the resume part. So previously that was one four-hour uh, session. We've divided it up, and this in a way is kind of an experiment. So thank you for helping us with the experimental part of this. 
Then there is, there is one final workshop that is called Acing the Interview. And all of these uh, can at various times be had at the, <clears throat> at the ACS meeting sometimes in regional meetings, and then sometimes there are career counselors like, like me who go around and, and, and give them in just the way we're doing now. There are also, uh, in, in the leadership development area for ACS, we have a series, uh, a series of courses in the leadership, uh, the leadership system. We have our professional education courses, and online business courses, and a number of other resources that, that can be had, some of which are available online, some of which are, in fact, person-to-person -person courses that, that are taught. So that's just kind of an overview of, of what the portfolio looks like. What we're going to talk about today is, is, is a bit about finding a place in, in industry. And we, in order to do that, we kind of have to, have to encourage you to find out a little bit about you and how you, how you might fit into to, to, to these, these sorts of things. What I'm, what I'm hoping we can accomplish this afternoon is to get a, a sense of what the value chain means, what that concept means in, 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 in industry and in chemistry. We're going to spend a, a, a fair amount of time analyzing job descriptions and, and what they mean and what you can take away from them. Uh, and in the end, I, I want you to have some kind of appreciation for the sort of positions that might be available in, in industry. And when, when paired with the knowledge of resume construction that you got this morning, to develop some tactics for, for uh, in, improving your, your potential success uh, as, as, as a candidate for, for positions. So. Um, what I'd like to, to do first is you all have the, the, uh, the career compass, correct? I'd like you to open that to page two. And this is perhaps the most open-ended question that you'll ever experience in your entire life. Read the instructions. It's essentially about imagining what sort of a position you might be interested in. And let's, take, uh, let's just take a couple of minutes uh, on, on this. You have uh, the directions there. Please read them, and I'll, uh, uh, I'll give you two minutes to, to write down your observations. And then I'm going to ask that, that you pair up with, with, with a partner. So we have four people in front. Just That's easy to do. Two, four, six, that's easy to do. If I might ask you to, to come, come down one, one please, then the, then the three of you in the back can sort of can perhaps work together. All right, so take a couple of minutes and... Uh, do the exercise, please. All right, go ahead. Talk this through with your, with your partner. Just describe a little bit about what, what you had written down and exchange some ideas. I'll warn you that I'm going to be asking you as individuals to describe what your partner said so it's important to pay attention when he or she says something. All right, so let's take about another 30 seconds and make sure that each of you has had the opportunity to talk a little about what you wrote. Um, 
Well, I think that once you get above a certain level, you have to be allowed to do that. Yeah. 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 All right. So, so have a look. Have a look up. Right. This, um, the the first part of this exercise is to get a sense of how specific you are about your objective at this point, how much you know, and how decided you are about uh, about things. So, from we've we described four types here from the very specific about a desired position in company. So for example, if you said, I want to be in chemical synthesis um, at Merck, you know, that's pretty specific. Okay, but then as, as you work your way out, uh, type two where you might be specific about a, a, a job area and a company type where you might be a, uh, an R&D technologist in, in, in uh, a chemical company involved in nanotechnology. Um, make sure you need to get two, uh, some handouts that are up at the top, please. Um, the third, you know, might be somewhat less specific, where you're saying, I'd, I'd kind of like to work in, in an analytical lab. You know, that's sort of at that specificity. And then type four is, please, Lord, I just need a damn job. Uh, and that's, that, that's, that's somewhat less specific. So my question is, how many of you had, had uh, partners who you would characterize as type one or type two? Okay. Okay, so tell me a little about the boxes over here. Tell me a little about her objective. Um, so she's looking for more uh, position in synthetic side. So she knows what she wants to do. Um, and then in terms of the companies, kind of uh, like pharma, mm -hmm. so a very specific company type. Um, mm -hmm. So that's kind of a one plus ish. Yeah. Didn't didn't name a company, but other than right, that, pretty yeah. well homed in. Right. On yeah. That. Yeah. Okay. Tell me what about his. I think he's uh, clear in terms of what he's looking for, that he wants a place where he can have uh, a combination of the fundamental principles and then try to uh, like look for a problem and then find a solution and try to apply it on the engineering side. So he pretty much has an idea in his mind what he wants to do and where he wants to go. So where would you put that on the target? So I would say between time two and time three. Yeah, I'd say it's two-ish, yeah. two-ish, yeah. but not quite so specific as, as, as you were. Let's let's do one more uh, of these. Who else had had a type one or a type two partner? Oh, now all the hands go down. <laughs> I see how this is going to be. I'm going to have to call on y'all. Um, all right, let's 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 come up to this to, to the two of you gentlemen. Talk a little bit about what your partner said. So he said he liked doing the like a job doing the as a research chemist or scientist. Okay, and where would you put that on the target? Uh, maybe type three. Yeah, sounds like type three to me. And how about your partner? What did he yeah, say? Yeah, same. He's also looking for a research chemist or scientist position. So it's a type three. Okay, that's fine. There's a reason. There's a, there's a, there's a reason for doing this because it, it we're, what we're trying to get at at the first part of this is not so much about the industry part, we're trying to get at you. And, there, and I'll explain why in a minute. What advantages would you see? What's, what's the advantage of, of placing yourself in a type one or type two area? And I'm gonna, since the two of you are both kind of in that area, please pass the box down this, well, actually, let's do it the other way. You are both type three. What's the advantage of, of, of I have to work the logistics. Of it. What's the advantage of being somewhere down here? So you are not specific about any, particular industry, wherever you can work like a, a chemist or scientist position. You can so you're open, you're open to opportunities. What's yeah. the disadvantage? What? What would be the disadvantage of being there? Um, so you're not very specific about your goal or something. If, you know, as the old saying goes, if you don't know where you're going, any road will take you there. Yeah. So it's it, 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 it's a matter of, of needing to be specific enough that you can, that you can describe what you want to do, but, but you know, but being more open to it. In type one and type two, pass the box down, please. What's what's the advantage of being as crystalline about things as, as, as you all are? I think, as you said, if you know what you're looking for, so you can have, you have a particular aim you are hitting at, so you, you know that you're looking for a scientific position, process chemistry, or say, some kind of synthesis, right? Mm -hmm. So you have your mind clear, so I think it's easier for you to look for a potential job. And, and 
and the, the disadvantage, of course, is of course you are you are restricted in terms exactly. of your application where you can go. So there. it's it's probably it, it you know you have to be true to yourself, but but if you're if you're here, this is way too unfocused for, for, for being ready for, for a job search. And, and if you're here, this is going to be a rifle shot through the heart of something. Um, having been through, most of you were through the resume a discussion this morning, so can you see how how you build a resume will also be kind of responsive to where you are on, on, on this target in terms of, of, of what you want? And that's, it's, that's something else that's important to know. Now I'm showing you showing you this. This is what we call the sweet spot diagram, because what we're trying to do is get to a point here at the at, at, at the intersection of your values, your strengths, and the market needs. Now let's talk about this just for a second, because here's why all three of those things are are, are important. First of all, if you have something that that is at the intersection of your values and your strengths, but the market isn't interested, we call that a hobby. Um, if you have something that is at the intersection of your strengths and the market needs, but it doesn't match the kind of job that you want or your values, that is drudgery. And if you are somewhere at the intersection of your values and the market needs, but they don't, it doesn't play to your strengths, you will fail because you don't have the tools to do it. And this is why, at, at least on a high-level basis, it's important that we be looking for something that integrates all of, all of those three things, that tries to, to, that tries to hit that sweet spot. So the first exercises we're going to do are exercises having to do with um, the values and the strengths, and then we'll talk a little bit about, about market needs. So um, this, this is kind of the bottom line of this first part. The more clear you are about these areas, the more successful you'll, you'll, you'll be, because you'll, you'll be better able to characterize whether you have a good chance of succeeding at, 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 at the jobs that, 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 you're, that, that you're looking for. Um, OK, so here are the kinds of things that we mean when we talk about values. So things like, do you value, is, are these important to you? Do you value advancement, is, is, is getting ahead, being promoted, being recognized? Are you goal-oriented? You, do, you do you set objectives and set, set out to achieve them? Do you prefer autonomy, or do you prefer working in a team? Um, are you are you challenge driven? Is it is it a matter of finding hard problems to work on that you get your satisfaction from solving hard problems? Um, what about security? Is job security uh, an, an, an issue for you? Are you driven by that? And there are people for whom having and keeping a job is the is is the number one the number one thing, and risk is anathema to them. Um, what about work-life balance? Is that is that important to you, and where does it, where does it fall in the overall spectrum? What about discovery? You know, frankly, I don't think any of us would have gotten into the science business if if we weren't turned on by discovery. But is it a primary driver for you? Is that is that why you do these things? Um, are you are you a perfectionist? Is 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 getting it absolutely right more important than getting it done on time? And I've presented that in a negative way. I don't mean to do so. But for some people, and there are some jobs for which perfectionism is absolutely necessary, if you are the kind of person that makes sure that every I is dotted and every T is crossed, that may be an important value to take into consideration. Finally, altruism. Um, is, is it important to you to have a job where you are doing work on behalf of other people? Or does it, is it just a matter of doing the science? So you see how the kinds of values here and what they mean to you could say something about the kind of job that, 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 that you, might, you might be looking for. So let's go ahead back to the career compass. And we're going to look at page three. And I'd like you to do an exercise here. <clears throat> Take the nine values that we've just talked about and rank them one to nine in their importance for you personally. Now, just as a clue on doing this, it's generally easier to knock out one and two and eight and nine, and then think about where, where the others fall in the middle. But let's take a couple of minutes and, and, and do this. OK, so I want to say a couple of things before we talk about this. The first thing is, is to say, I've asked you to describe yourself in a very, very short period of time. And it's entirely possible that if I gave you more time, you might, you might have a bit more granular description of what's important to you and why. 
The other thing that is true is that your opinion can change over the course of time. This is, this is an absolute point in time determination, but it's not necessarily true that the person who you will be in five years would rank the same things in, in the same order again. So as you consider your career, the job that you have, in addition to right now the job that you might want, it's important to continue to evaluate what's important to you at this at this time and do you match up with the, the kinds of things that, you, that you're doing. So um, who, this is embarrassing, you know, close your eyes, nobody look at the, at, at the hands in the air. Um, for, for how many people was advancement important? So, so what kind of a what kind of a, a company might you work for if you were uh, if if advancement was important to you? Large, small, uh, you know, pharmaceutical, uh, you know, government. What 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 sort of, of of part of industry might you work for if advancement were important? You for advancement probably medium or large. Company. Probably, because what you want, if, if your goal is, is to advance in rank, then there have to be ranks to advance to. So if you have a very flat structure, where, like in a small company, where, where, where everyone's kind of on the same level and then there's the boss, then, then you're going to have to be driven by something else, because there really aren't the opportunities for, for advancement in this. So what about challenge? Who's motivated by challenge? So what kind of, what kind of company, let's pass, pass the box down, down here. What type of company might might you work for if, if challenge was a driver for you? Uh, maybe a startup company because it's usually it's uh, it's it's where the you need a lot of uh, what perseverance to mm -hmm. make a successful startup company. Mm -hmm. That's absolutely right. But I'm gonna I'm gonna go further than that, and I'm gonna I'm gonna generalize to say challenge is where you find it um, in in industry. You may well find that you are working on more challenging problems than you would have in academia. And the reason for that is because in many cases in industry, there are things that people have already tried and failed. So you are now coming in as the third or fourth person to take a crack at what's, what's necessary here. And if there was easy stuff, it's already been done. So, so there, may be, there may be challenges everywhere you go, and sometimes the challenge is, 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 is in your head, and, and, it's, and it's how you make it. David, you want a, you want a piece of this, too? No, I was going to say that. that in you got to use the box. Yeah, I was going to say that, that in industry, there are uh, real-world challenges, and so it doesn't matter if it's big, small, or the... Okay, okay, good. All right, so... Um, if you are, we've already had one value associated with working with a large company. What other values might you find if you if, if you were working for a large company? If you were working for for Dow or Exxon, go ahead, Amy. Uh, discovery, I think, because they actually have the money to devote to something that may not necessarily be um, completely outcome oriented. So, um, or is that counterintuitive? <laughs> no, it's no, no, it's no, no, it's not. It's probably true, but and, and there, there are more opportunities than that. Um, what, what would be the least likely of those values to be associated with a large company? Would you say, since you've got the microphone? You know, I'm tempted to say altruism, but that's not true because you see lots of companies devoting money to lots of great causes. But maybe perfectionism because you have to get stuff done. You have to have deliverables at a large company. It will matter where you are in the company. The one that I was that, that I was going for was autonomy, mm -hmm. um, because oh, that's that's going that's <laughs> that's going to be hard to come by in in, in, in a big in a big mm -hmm. company. And so uh, you can see how these these different values might weigh differently in going to different kinds of, of companies. And that's why it's important for you to sort of understand yourself as, 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 as you do this. All right, so, so there, we have, there we have values. Now let's talk about strengths. There are five um, sets of strengths that we're going to talk about as, as, as those that are important for industry. Now, you will remember this, this morning when we talked about resumes. These are also the kinds of areas that you're going to want to develop some points about which you can talk with respect to yourself and places where you can give examples of where you have done something that demonstrate your strengths in, in these five areas. Let's talk about them. 
the technical strengths, I, I mean, that's, that's pretty much obvious, isn't it? I mean, for, for most cases. I think you're going to discover that when we talk about the various places that you can be in the value chain, technical strengths will be more or less important depending on the kind of the kind of the kind of job that you're doing. But certainly, because we're here talking about about science, technical strengths could, could very well be important. Leadership strengths, and we talked this morning a little bit about the difference between leadership and management. And you need to be capable of both, and it's generally capable of both, but at different times. There are times when you need to be strategic, when you need to be operating at a 10,000 foot level, when you need to be thinking about six months and a year out in advance, and you need to be leading by example so people can follow you. There are also times when it's really important to be getting the work done that has to be done by Friday because you have a presentation, or when you have people who are reporting to you that you have to place into positions in order to get that, that work done efficiently, that you know how to manage an organization in, in, in order to get that, that, that accomplished. And it's important to start you know, collecting examples of places where you have been a leader, where you've demonstrated your leadership, where you've had management responsibilities, and where, and where you have demonstrated that. Even if you don't have people reporting to you, it doesn't management. I asked this question once, and, and, and somebody said, well, management is where you tell people what to do. Yeah. Well, OK, kind of, <laughs> but, but, but that, really, that really misses the important part of management, which is, the efficient allocation of resources in order to accomplish a job that has to, that has to get done. Team strengths, we talked a little bit about, about that, that this morning, about your ability to work as, as a team member in a couple of different ways. Sometimes it's working as, as an effective member of a team. Sometimes it's working as an effective leader of, of a team. Sometimes it's learning to work with people on a team that you don't really get along with. There are all manner of challenges here that, 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 you, that, you have to, that you have to find and overcome. And finally, communication strengths. Can you speak? Can you write? Do you feel confident doing those things? And you'll be asked, you'll be asked to do those over and over again. Um, and it's, and the, the thing about speaking and writing is you can't really be taught how to speak or write. The only way to do it is to do those things. So my advice is give yourself every opportunity that you have to speak in, in, in a public uh, public situation to get used to that I idea, and also to write for consumption by, by, by others. It's good practice to have, and it's something that you will use all of, all of your life. As one small anecdote, for me personally, I was an adequate scientist. I wasn't a great scientist, but I was a pretty good communicator. And when you put those two things together, along with a respect for, but not a fear, of standing in front of a hostile audience, that's how I made a career. So you can you can take those things and put them together into something that, that, that's really really quite valuable as well as being quite necessary. Okay, so now let's go back to the career compass. You have on page four the opportunity to to jot down a few notes for yourself of places where you might have done things that demonstrate your technical strengths, or your leadership, or your management. And I'm, <clears throat> I'm going to give you what will seem like a very short period of time to do this, and if you don't get them all done, that's fine. Take it offline. But one of the reasons you're going to be doing this is because at some point, you're going to be using that to feed into either resume construction or to modifying the resume that you have. And it's important to give yourself some keywords to remind you of those, those, those important stories that you can tell. So let's take about three minutes on this. Okay, Amy, pass the microphone up to the third, the third row, please. So did any of the three of you find it easy or difficult to identify what might be called your top two strengths? Which of the three, who, easy, who's a whole group? Who's on easy to find the top two strengths? Okay, and how about, how about those that, that what were you sort of the bottom that you're a little weak on? How easy was that? No weakness whatsoever. So tell me, tell me why, why you feel that way. Tell me what you think is weak and why. Well, what is uh, your name, please? Michelle. Michelle. Yeah. So I just felt like I was a little weak on the management side, but that's just because um, I currently I just have a bachelor de bachelor's degree, so I don't know that I have as much experience to like mm -hmm. potentially be managing other other people or be in that situation. And, and so where are you in your career? Are you in grad school or? Um, I'm working here. So I see, yeah. okay, okay. What about the, the other two of you guys? What's, what, what was, what, go ahead over here. What's your key strength? 
um, the technical strengths, mm -hmm. technical success. All right. Yeah. So just out of curiosity, how many of you put technical for your key, your key, your top strength? Yeah, that's that. That's not uncommon at this at this stage in your career. Now, what was second? Um, in your mind, I mean, I, I, uh, I know you didn't rank them. I'm just asking you. What do you think is your second? Uh, team success. Okay. Okay. And and do those two things work together at all? <clears throat> Yeah. I mean, do they kind of reinforce one another? Yeah, you have to to, to have the technical experience so that you can help the team as a whole, and you have to put that in, in, in mind. So, like when when you work, you have to uh, think about the team to use your strengths. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, one of the things that we try to teach in the leadership development courses, you know, usually the, the usual logic on these things is. If you're strong in one area and weak in another area, usually what you hear from a manager is, well, let's 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 bolster let's bolster the, the weak areas. What we teach in our in our leadership development courses is is a bit different. And and that is unless you have a decided weakness in those areas that will hold you back, then you're probably better off driving your strengths. Now here's the exception to this in this in in this case because we're talking about five core things that are going to be uh, uh, instrumental in, in any success that you use. I'm going to suggest that, that, that you need to at least be up to a certain level in each of the five because people will be asking you about that. But as you go, as you go through life, don't worry too much about being mediocre at everything. Be great at something. That, that, that helps. The world will always pay for the best in the field. So anyway, that kind of gives you an idea about, about strengths. And you're going to start collecting things about your strengths, and you're going to start, we're not doing the interview module, but you're going to start collecting stories about yourself, such that, such that you have, have maybe five stories about your career that crystallize some of the things that are, that are important to you. And the reason for this, that are important for describing you as, 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 as in your career. And the reason this is important is because when you interview, you're going to get lots of questions about, tell me about a time when. And you're not in an interview, you're not going to be able to cough that up if you've never thought about it before. On the other hand, if there are five seminal stories about you that encompass, you know, the, the typical kind of, kind of, kind of story where there's, there's, uh, a victim, a villain, and a vindicator, where, where, where you've experienced conflict and triumph, or for that matter, experienced conflict and failed but learned from it. Assemble five of those stories because almost every one of these behavioral questions, if viewed correctly, will fit back to one of those five seminal stories about you. And you may not be able to answer. So let's, let's say, for example, they ask, they, they ask you a question. Tell me a time when you had uh, had a, a very difficult disagreement with your boss and, and how you resolved that. Now, not everyone is going to have that experience. So wh what you can say in, in an interview like that is to say, well, you know, I've gotten along with my boss very well, but I understand the question. Let me tell you about a time where I had a conflict that, that had to be resolved. Here's, here's how I resolved it. And in essence, what you're doing is you're shifting back to a story that you can tell. You haven't avoided the question. But you've taken the sense of the question, put it in the right context, and used something that you know very well in order to answer the question. So that's that's I realize that's kind of a deep argument. That's one of the reasons for using this part is to start assembling your list of five seminal stories about you. So now let's talk a little bit about job market trends and 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 and, and implications. Um, now a lot of this comes from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. And frankly, I don't think they can predict the future any better than anybody else can, although they do a pretty damn good job of looking back at where they've been. But I think some of these things are, 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 are worth taking in, into consideration because, because I think some of them really are, are, are pretty true. Um, there is growth expected in the US in the chemical and material science industries. There's particularly growth in, in manufacturing chemistry, and much of it is due to inexpensive and, and abundant natural gas. There's a huge amount of capital being expended in, expended in the US in, in chemical plants associated with, with, with utilization of, of natural gas as a raw material. It is also fair to say that there are people like me retiring. 
and you know we've been saying this for 20 years that people would, would retire. Two things happen when, when, when older chemists retire. One is they need to be replaced, and two is they don't need to be replaced. And you see, you see some, of, some of both of those things. But what I will say that we've seen, particularly in the last five to 10 years, is a lot of companies that had a hole in the middle of, of, of their age demographic to where they had people who were relatively old and ready to graduate and people who were very young. And the reason that hole was in the middle is sort of the 1980s and the 1990s when, when, when th people weren't hired very much. So a lot of companies have, have, have gone out to try to hire people who can train before the, the older component leaves. So you don't, you don't have a loss of that, of, of that local knowledge. There's, there are probably more opportunities for people with, with the advanced de degrees and with work experience. When you talk about unemployment, you have, you, you have the, the chem census. When you talk about unemployment in, in chemistry, particularly as we measure it in, in, in ACS, generally the numbers are relatively low. Now, you can argue that perhaps there's a selection bias there and that you're not getting to everybody, but I don't know how to get to everybody. But the, the point is unemployment is relatively low but there are, there are spots where it's a little, bit, a little bit difficult. It's a little more difficult if you're very old or very young. It's a little more difficult, difficult if you're just getting out with a bachelor's degree. So if you are young and just graduating with a bachelor's degree, that's probably where the numbers are worst right now. And one of the reasons, I think, is because we're graduating a lot more BS chemists today than we did 10 years ago by about 50%. We now graduate about 18,000 BS chemists a year, where five to 10 years ago, we were graduating about 12,000. <clears> In the old days, old being 10 years ago, generally, BS chemists would go half to grad school or professional school and half to work. The half that goes to graduate or professional school is about half to chemistry and half to, 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 to the other professions. Now what happens is when you've gone from 12,000 graduates to 18,000 graduates, the spots over here in professional schools haven't changed very much. Those, those are still probably about the same, and particularly for grad school and chemistry. So what that means is that there's much more of a supply for the people who are going out to, to try to find something to do, and I think that's why you have that, that hole at the BS chemist level early on in, 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 the, in the career. There are places that you can go to look for trends. This is the Bureau of Labor, Labor Statistics, uh, looking for the physical and social sciences. Um, CNEN uh, uh, does employment things. Well, they do regularly. Every, every month or so, there's, there's, a, there's an article on employment in the back of the magazine. But also, there are, there are regular articles about, uh, about hiring and salaries. And also, there are a number of ACS webinars that, that are related to business, entrepreneurship, and, 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 and other, other statistics. So things of increasing demand and decreasing demand, um, it's, it's useful to pull this apart a bit. Contract research and testing services. One of the things that, that's, that's happened over the course of the last 10 to 15 years, particularly in the pharmaceutical industry, is that, is that pharma has gone from being a very vertically integrated industry. And what I mean by that is from doing everything in one company, from finding, you know, discovering the molecule, um, testing it, scaling it up, uh, manufacturing it, stamping your name on the pills, um, marketing it, selling it, all this stuff used to be done by each individual company. And in the last 15 years or so, it has changed from a very vertically integrated industry to kind of a hub and spoke industry. In that, in, in that you will do some of your own research, but you'll watch other people doing research. And you'll have alliances, either with, with universities or sometimes with even foundations. There are, there are some companies that have, that have an alliance with, with, with foundations in terms of, 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 of money to do, to do work. Sometimes you'll simply watch smaller companies as they get to the point of having something that looks good. You go out and buy it. These companies see this as de-risking because you don't own everything. And, and yeah, yes, you don't win everything if you win, but you don't lose everything if you lose as well. Think about it also from the perspective of manufacturing. They're looking for more scalable manufacturing where I can manufacture as much as I want or as little as I want depending on what, what the market is asking for and I don't have to go out and build a plant every time I want to, want to make something so I don't have the capital cost. So what's, what's happening here by that, that kind of de-risking, by that kind of, of, of graduating from vertical integration 
to, to a hub and spoke kind of system. It means that many things that we used to do internally all the time, we now farm out to, to, to other organizations. There's good news and bad news here. The bad news is it used to be if you wanted to work in pharma, you just write to Merck and to Lilly and all the big companies, and that's where all the jobs were. Um, but that's not the way it is anymore. The jobs are everywhere. And in fact, about half of the jobs that we see people going to are in small to medium-sized enterprises, not the large enterprises. And we also see that, that the big companies are farming out a fair amount of, 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 of their work to, to contract research or, or service organizations. But the good news there is that somebody got to do that work, and that's where an opportunity is. So some other, some other trends, toxicology and environmental chemistry becoming, becoming more important, um, marketing and sales, Specialized R&D, that kind of you know, goes, in, goes into this as, as well. Material science and, 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 and so on. And, and we talked a little bit about the advanced degrees uh, being increasing in demand. Decreasing demand, um, we don't put many scientists into basic chemicals, into commodity chemicals. You do a lot, you do a lot of manufacturing. So it's a great place for engineers, and, and particularly BS engineers, and not so much for, for PhD chemists or PhD engineers. Um, plastic and, and synthetic materials, the plastics industry has matured considerably over the last 40 years, and people aren't devising brand new polymers um, anymore. Where, what happens there is more blending, more applications oriented, it's further down the development line and not so much in, in the <coughs> research area. Um, pharmaceutical manufacturers are in the process of, of reorienting their businesses. Uh, but, you know, for all of the layoffs that we've seen in pharma, most of those people have found a place to work because it's not, it wasn't a matter of no need for pharmaceuticals. It was a matter of reshuffling the chairs into different companies and different kinds of companies. Um, so, and also uh, paints and allied uh, products. I, I, you know, I, I would argue that there's always a, a need for, for coatings. There's always new work to be done in the coatings business. Um, and then finally, BS positions. That's kind of an idea of some of the things that, that, that may be increasing and, and may, and, and may be, be decreasing. So um, I'm going to skip, uh, I'm gonna skip this, this, this one, and we're going we're gonna to move on a little bit um, to, to talk about the value chain and, and, and what it means. This is kind of a graphic illustration of what a chemical company, or for that matter, lots of companies look like, where you have um, you have what, what might be called the line functions here in the value chain, and then you have support functions. And we're going to talk about each of these as we go. Now, can you, can you see that from starting from here, this is sort of the furthest back in the chain from R&D to product development, manufacturing, quality control, regulatory, and sales and marketing. Can you see how this gets closer and closer to the marketplace as you, as you, as you go from, from, from left to right? Not every company will have all of these boxes. And some will emphasize some of those boxes more than others. Recognize that this is simply a stylistic view of what, of, of what a company, company looks like. Also, there are plenty of places that have to support the line activity. And, and we'll talk about each of these as we go. So I'm guessing that this group is pretty familiar with what basic research is like. Where you're doing, you're doing science to a good extent, either for science's sake or science with a relatively long fuse to, 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 to bring to the marketplace. There are um, companies do still do basic science, but there's a lot less of it than was done 40 years ago. And, and the reason is because, I'll be very honest, because of pressure from the street. You have, you have pressure to invent products, get them out, and make money from them. And so it requires a particular kind of company with a particular kind of commitment to be able to do the kind of research that we might have thought of as being done at Bell Labs you know, 40 years ago or DuPont Center Research 40 years ago. Nonetheless, <clears throat> some of this work still gets, still gets done. It, it may not be you know, the real basic R&D. You may not be discovering lasers anymore. Okay? Maybe, that's, maybe that's all Google you know, for, for autonomous cars. But the whole, point of the, the whole point of this, just as it is in any research, is to identify a problem that can be solved through chemistry that, in fact, can support the business that, 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 that the company is in. And when you, start, when you start looking for titles in this area, you know, there's going to be something in common where it talks about R&D scientists, 
Um, Typically, you're going to see the, the, the letter R there. Now, there are some places that will tell you, yes, this is an R and D position, but it's kind of a little R, big D position, where, where in, they're acting closer to the marketplace with development rather than research. And that's where we're going next, is in, into product development. So this may not be in, in a research area where, you're, where you're, you're breaking brand new territory. You may be working in territory that's reasonably well known, but you'll be solving different kinds of problems for different kinds of customers utilizing some of the tools that you all already have. Um, uh, you, can also, you, you can also be working here where you work more directly with a customer that has, that has an application to where you spend time understanding what it is that they do, you take it back to your laboratory and you think about how to, how to help solve their, their, their problem. So once again, advantages and disadvantages. The disadvantage of this is, you know, maybe you're not doing, you know, groundbreaking science. The advantage is you're you're doing something that's going to find its way into the marketplace relatively quickly, and it just once again depends on what what your values are. I personally, for me, I I wanted to to work in an area where I could see the stuff that I did and the stuff that I made find its way out into the marketplace where people could use it. I was an electrochemist in grad school. I got tired of going to, to cocktail parties and trying to explain to people what I did and just giving them brain damage. I wanted to be, I, I wanted to be able to show them, Wait, see, you see that stuff over there? That's what we make. I mean, that, for me, that's, that, 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 that's where I wanted to be. So now there's other kinds of work that you can do in the development area. Some of it, some of it winds up being what you might call formulations chemistry. So even in the plastics industry, you know, plastic is not all one thing, as, as most of you know. And also, you typically don't use the native polymer the way it comes out of the reactor. It needs to be compounded with other things. Some things are trivial, things like pigments, if it has to be colored. But it's some, some things are, are, are very different. So you may need UV stabilizers. You may need plasticizers. You may need fillers. You might need an impact modifier. And you might, you might need to formulate that all in a way that it does a particular job for a particular customer. Think about it from a, on, on the pharmaceutical basis. It's not all about the active molecule in the pharma, pharmaceutical. It's how it gets delivered to somebody. It's how you, the form that it winds up in when you make a pill out of it or a liquid out of it, and what, what it gets mixed with and how it's formulated in, in order to put in people's hands. So understanding the interactions of the materials that might be put together into that formulation and working with the customer is another sort of part of, of product development. So, then you can, if you're looking for uh, for positions, you know where they talk about a product development chemist or or a development chemist, you're looking for for this this kind of kind of word for uh, the type of work that gets done in in the, in the product development area. Now, manufacturing is pretty obvious as to what as to what you're doing, and and in some places for people like you, manufacturing won't be a strong option. On the other hand, there are some places where, where they will. So for example, um, I, I know from some of the, the people I've talked to at, at, at Indiana who are, are getting out right now, um, Intel is, is hiring tons of PhDs. And in essence, they're going into a manufacturing operation. And the reason they're doing that is because, because they feel that the PhDs are better equipped to deal with issues. And this isn't a fab, OK? So this may not be your, um, in, in, in your particular field. But they're looking for people with that level to work in a true manufacturing uh, operation. That's kind of uncommon. It's much more common in the chemical industry to find the people working in manufacturing are process engineers, most of which will be BS or maybe master's engineers. Uh, if you have a PhD as, as an engineer and you're working in industry, you're probably not out in the plant, but you may well be designing operations for the plant. You may be doing something that's, that, that, that's more of, a, of, of an upper, upper level function. So for many of you, manufacturing in itself may, may, may not be the place that, 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 you're, that you're looking, but I want, I want you to understand how this, this fits into the chain. And when we talk about supply chain and, and, and distribution, another way of talking about this has to do with logistics. Because if you're making stuff, you have to get all the materials one place staged in the, at the same time. You have to understand how things are scheduled through a, a facility. I mean, you don't get a brand new plant to work from every time you change out a product. And sometimes it's important to know how to, how to stage those products so that you're not going from, from you're not going, making a transition from something that's absolutely incompatible 
with the next thing to come through the plant because that will require a major clean down and it will cost you time. So the logistics of how you bring stuff together, manufacture it, and maximize the output from the facility, that's kind of what we're talking about with the, you know, with this, the front end supply chain. And then there's the logistics of how, of how things get delivered, um, how, how you stage, in, in our business it's all rail cars, how you stage rail cars to get things to people at the, at, at, at the right time. These are probably not the kinds of jobs that, that you might directly have, but it's important to understand how they fit in, 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 into the overall spectrum because every, every company has, has manufacturing and, su and supply chain issues. And regardless of, of where, where you work anywhere in the chain, that's going to be important to you in terms of the function of, of your company. I will say this, that when I went into industry, the first thing that I had to learn to do was speak engineer because there was not a thing that I was going to do in a laboratory that would make a damn bit of difference to anybody if it didn't go through a plant. So I had to learn what the really important things were to the engineers in the plant and how to talk to them about what, it, what, what, I, was, what I was doing. This is, it's an aside, but this is one of the things that as chemists, now for those of you who are engineers, you can just you know silently smile. As chemists, we don't value the kinds of engineering things that are absolutely critical when you're when, when you're working in manufacturing. We particularly don't value scale up. So when when we're working in a lab, you know, in a five milliliter round bottom flask, um, moving heat away is pretty easy, you know, with all that all that surface to volume ratio. On the other hand, in, in commodity chemistry particularly, virtually anything that you do, your productivity is a function of your ability to take heat away. And, and scaling from that five milliliter flask to a 40,000 gallon reactor is not trivial. But whether you are an engineer that has to do it, or whether you are a scientist who has to understand why that's important and take it into account when, 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 you, when you do your research, it's, it's important on, on, on both sides. And frankly, as chemists, we, we could do ourselves a favor if we got a little bit better at that. Quality control and regulatory affairs. So. Um, some people uh, talk about QA and QC, quality uh, assessment and, and quality control. Um, quality is different things to, to, to different people. Over the course of the last 20 years, um, one of the big trends was something called, called Six Sigma. And Six Sigma was a program that was designed to understand your manufacturing in a way that you could manufacture exactly what you wanted and not just make a spectrum of stuff and, 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 and pick shipments and, and, and ship it to people. So in a way, it's a statistical process control thing, but, it all, but there's, a, there's a second part of it. Don't ship material to people who can't appreciate the quality that's built in. Let me give you another example. How many of you know how to use every feature in Microsoft Word? I'm, I'm shocked. No hands? But at, 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 the, at the same time, there are features of Microsoft Word that, that, that you use all the time. So if you were going in to buy a word processing program and you knew exactly what you were going to do, you could say, give me these pieces because that's all I ever do. I don't need all the rest of this stuff. Well, manufacturing is the same way. It's not necessarily the case that you have to manufacture the best thing for everybody. What you have to manufacture is something that meets their needs but meets it every time reliably and reproducibly. So that's part of, of, of what goes into designing quality with respect to manufacturing. It's a matter of understanding your customers and understanding how to give them exactly what they want right in the middle of, 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 what, of what they need without selling them too much or too little. Now there are other things associated with, 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 with quality control and, and regulatory. And this is a place if you happen to be a perfectionist, if that's, if that's one of your values, working your way into the regulatory area could be a really good niche for you. The chemical industry is a highly regulated industry, regardless of what you hear from anyone else. And what's more, screwing up has costs. And as a result, each one of us in the, in the chemical industry has entire departments that are responsible for understanding regulations and making sure that we comply with them as, as, as we go. And this is, this is deadly serious, and it's, it's, a, it's a matter of, of the sort of thing where if you are the kind of person who can understand rules, understand how to play a game, and make sure that the game gets played, and have enough of a perfectionist to you to be able to say, and we have to do this right every time because there are consequences, 
regulatory can be can be an, an interesting place for you. Now, it's also the sort of thing that you really have to kind of know something about what you do for a living as, as a company. Because you're going to have to understand the manufacturing well enough to know why it's difficult. It's not just a matter of reading the rule to somebody and saying, did you do this all the time? It's a matter of understanding why that could be difficult to do. And, and also having enough understanding that, that you can work with the people who are, 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 are making the stuff or the manufacturing area and work with them with respect to keeping them on the right side of the regulations while understanding where their challenges are. So this is, this is a place that it might not be the first job you ever have in industry, but if you're that kind of person, uh, there's a demand for that. Think about it Think about it another way. You know, this is, uh, Janet, this is what Bonnie Carpenter does. Think about it from, you know, from the perspective of a pharmaceutical business. Think about how when you're developing drugs and you're spending all your time interacting with FDA, I mean, that's a place where it requires a perfectionist because the rules are such what FDA wants you to do uh, is, is, is quite demanding, and somebody has to be the referee in order, in order to make it, make it happen. So you can, you can see you know, these kinds of, these, these kinds of, of um, titles for, for positions. Um, sometimes you see you know, things like validation specialist, document coordinator, those, 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 those sorts of things. Those things don't really tell the full story of, of what kind of technical knowledge you have to have. It's not just a matter of filing documents. It's a matter of understanding the rules and keeping your company on the right side of them. <clears throat> Finally, there's, there's, there's sales and marketing. And you know, you, you might say, yeah, but geez, yeah, I'm a scientist. I don't, you know, I don't want to be in sales and marketing. But let me give you an example. Well, okay, so I, I helped to put myself through college selling used cars. So when, you know, Janet didn't know this about me, doesn't that, doesn't that explain a lot of things that you've never known over, those, uh, over the years? So, so let's, first of all, who knows what the difference is between sales and marketing? Anybody want to take a crack at this? I will volunteer you. Sir, I would like you to take a crack at the difference between sales and marketing. Can we have the box, please? So marketing involves uh, strategies to sell the product by advertising and uh, sales actually involves selling the product and making money. That's not bad. That's, that's really pretty good. That's really pretty good. So if you are a marketer, it's your job to understand what the marketplace wants and figure out how your research people can make it, can, can design it, how your manufacturing people can make it, how you can put it in a customer's hand and do it at a price that both pleases them and makes money for you. So marketing is, is in many cases more of a more of a strategic kind of kind, kind, kind of a job. Now sales is, is where you are more directly involved with the customer and understanding the customer's needs. You're the person that calls on them, you know, once every week, two weeks, a month, and so on, understands how you how your product is working, and you are in a way the team captain for the company with respect to how that company interacts with, it, with its customer. Because when there's a problem, you have to know whether you call the tech service person, whether you talk to manufacturing, who you got to talk to in order to get the problem solved, and you spend a lot of time negotiating with, 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 with people in, in, order, in order to fix the problems that inevitably happen. But the hallmark of being in sales is that person-to-person -person interaction with, 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 some, with someone who, who is a customer. I used to think of people as being fundamentally marketing types or fundamentally sales types. And the difference being a, a marketing type tended to be a person who might be happier back in the, in the office thinking about, about what to do with the product and the sales type might be happier out in, in, in the marketplace with, 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 with the customer and, and having the personal interaction. Not everybody is all one way. But I think, I think like being an introvert or an extrovert, you have, you, you have a strong suit one place or, or another place. Now, if you're a technical person, why, why might this be of interest to you? Well, let's take something that's really obvious. Let's say just for an example that you're an analytical chemist, you're an expert with a particular instrument, and you get hired by a company that manufactures those instruments. What you're going to be doing is spending a lot of time at trade shows or in customers' laboratories explaining how to use this, this, this device I mean, you may not necessarily be the person who's collecting the check when they pay for it, but, but you will do a lot of outreach to people who can use this device, and it will be dependent on your technical capability to make it sing. 
So there's, there's a, a distinct place in, in the chemical industry where a person with an advanced degree could easily end up in a sales position and have it be a satisfying technical position as, as well. Many people will go, in, will go into a company, will start in a technical area, and will decide that they would like to do something uh, more on, on, the business, on the business side. Janet, you've got an MBA, and it was not something that you went straight out of school to do. You went back to do it. Uh, and many, many people will do that because they find the challenges of business are also as, as challenging as, as the technical challenges in, 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 in a different way. So it's a, a thoroughly legitimate place to end up. I had, I had marketing jobs during, during, during my career. I had a job as in, in terms of commercial development, which is, which is sort of a, a division of marketing. So you can, you can find things that are technical sales, technical marketing support, product manager, um, product support specialist. These are the kinds of names that you, that, that, you might, that you might see. But it has to do with getting the product from where it's manufactured to a customer thinking strategically how to do that or tactically how to, how to get it in his hands and solve problems. The support functions, um, this, is, this is a very broad range of, of, of things that, 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 that support uh, the overall, uh, the overall all, all stream. Um, you could, in support, some of, your, some of your QA and QC might be back in support, particularly if, it, if, if it's not something that's happening every day that's a part of, of design. You may be designing tests. You may, be, you may be thinking about, about other things that, that support manufacturing. Probably the easiest thing to see in the support function is, is the IP part of it, um, where, where you, you manage the patent, the patent portfolio that, that, that the company has. You know what, gets, what, what to patent and why. You know, you know when to talk to the attorneys about, about policing your patents. Um, being an, an IP specialist can be tremendous support to a company, particularly if, if a very technically uh, based company. You also see such things here as a as, as technical writer. Um, Janet and I have, have, have a friend, Lisa Balbus, who um, has been at this now about 25 years. But she became a technical writer because when she got out of grad school at North Carolina, she, had, she and her husband moved someplace. She'd been promised a job. And when she showed up the first day, it evaporated. So then what do you do? Well, um, she discovered somebody who needed to have a manual written for a device that they, that they were building, and they needed somebody to write the manual. Well, you know, this is not trivial, because what, what you have to do in order to do this, you have to understand the device, you have to understand the way it works, and you have to write in a clear and cogent way that people who want to operate the device can do so. And Lisa, over the course of 25 years, has made a very nice little business for, for herself as a technical writer in, in very many different sorts, sorts of areas. And that's a place where you can, where, where if it's what you like to do, that you can find a way of taking your technical capability and your ability to teach people technical stuff, you know, teach you know, non-technical or less technical people about technical things, that can be, that, that can be a, a real, a real boon. So, you can kind of you can kind of see communication specialist, technical writer. Um, we, we we talked a little about the business development manager, commercial commercial development. If you have this kind of job, it's a matter of saying where's our next dollar coming from? What can we do that we don't do now that will fit in with our manufacturing, that will fit in with our technical capabilities? What what product niches are we not are we not filling? And what has to be done in 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 order in order to get there? It's, it's, it's kind of like marketing, but it's a little more than marketing because marketing typically deals with products that are being made already. Business development has the aspects of, of technical. To some extent, it has manufacturing, and to some extent, it has, it has marketing and sales because it's sort of an incubator until it grows to a point where you can hand it over to the, to, to, to the, the full-scale full scale business. Um, HR is, you know... I don't know. I, I never really wanted to work in HR, but here's a place where you can do a tremendous amount of good for your company if you happen to be a technical person working in the HR area, and that's in hiring people. Um, there are all manner of horror stories that can be told about the times that, that companies sent the HR person with no technical background out to interview the PhDs. I was in HR for Yes? Yeah, I was. I don't know if you know that about me. I, I was in not. HR for three years. Um, I uh, 
ran compensation and benefits here for this company on three different occasions for three years back in the 80s. And the reason I did that is I had just finished up my MBA and the laboratory was designing the triple career path for scientists and engineers here at the lab. And they didn't have an SME on the team. And I said, you don't know reality. I'm, I'm a researcher. I've grown up from a one to a four in the system. You know, you got to have somebody who's been there and done that. So it's a, it's an interesting alternative path. Um, and also, one, one other thing is true. Sometimes over your career path, you'll be asked to do some of these things that are not necessarily what you would think would be your, 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 your uh, technical core. So Don Mason mm -hmm. um, from, from Eastman, who is a colleague of ours at, at ACS, deeply technical, PhD, um, has spent the last, what, did she spend two or three years in, 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 in HR? And yeah. it was mainly because the company wanted her to have some seasoning in another, in another, in another area. So the reason I'm telling you this is not necessarily that any of these jobs is, is the one that you're going to go out and go for. I want to show you that there are a zillion places that people who have the technical knowledge that you have can function in an industry because maybe you're not using that every day. But the fact that you have that capability informs your ability to do any of these other jobs and to do them better. Okay, so. I've, I've dragged you through all this so you could do yet another exercise. <clears throat> if you look at page six, you have, you have an exercise where you have questions uh, at the end, what kind of industry might I want to search for a job in, which function might I want to work in, and what might be a job title I'd be interested in pursuing. Take a look at that. Make some notes. See if there's anything that appealed to you in this. I'm going to give you about three minutes, and, and at the end, I, I'd like to have Anyone who, who got some insight from this into something that kind of looked interesting that you didn't realize was out there, talk about what you saw and, and, and why it might be something you'd like to explore a little further. All right, so let's take about three minutes on this. That you hadn't thought of before. Here's the piece down here first and then back over there. Uh, I'd honestly never considered working in HR. Um, it, it never occurred to me, but the fact that you might actually need a a scientist to ask technical questions and be able to understand the answers, um, that hadn't occurred to me. And yeah, I think that might be something I'd like to do. It, it can be. Let me give you an example of how you can, how you can, how you can, as a company, you can fail at this. A colleague of mine, Pete Mahaffey, when we were in grad school, um, who wound up in academia, but this happened to be an, an interview, and I think it was the Brown and Williamson Tobacco Company, so it shows you how long ago it was. Mm -hmm. And they, they sent in someone to do the interview. Pete went into the interview, sat down, and introduced himself. And, and the guy said, well, it's very nice to meet you, uh, Peter. He said, but I don't really understand why you're here. He said, well, you advertised a, a, a job, uh, and I came for an interview. And the guy from Brown and Williamson said, yes, but um, you know, we're looking for chemists. And Pete said, well, I, I'm, I'm a chemist. And the guy said, no, it's not what your resume says. Peter says, what, what do you mean? The, the, and the HR guy says, well, it says right here you're a philosophy major. Oh, jeez. Oh. You're getting a doctor of philosophy. Yeah. Okay, well, there are some things from which you cannot recover. This is one of those things where yeah. maybe you didn't want to work there anyway. Yeah. But but that's that's the kind of thing that, that that's a very extreme example. Yeah. But, but that's, and, and, and in many cases, you might have recruiting activity as part of another activity in the company, mm -hmm. but it is not out of the realm of possibility for a technical, for a technical company to, to have that kind of position. Okay, David, now you. I like the, uh, I didn't know about the business development, like if, if, a, if a company could make new products or work in new areas, that seems interesting for me. Yeah, and, and it, may be, it, it may be that there's basic research that's required to do that, but what goes along with the business development, it's not just the technical. It's understanding if there's a business there. It's a matter of understanding what the market can be. It's a matter, you know, if you were an entrepreneur, you're in business development, but you'd be, you would be doing, you know, a business plan to see if there's any money to be made from doing this at all. So, so yes, absolutely, that, there, there's an opportunity. Anybody else want to take a crack at this? Yes, go ahead, Amy. Uh, so actually, my parents also asked why my degree said philosophy on it. Well, you'll have this. <laughs> um, but 
I actually was a little surprised about marketing. That's something that I hadn't considered before, but I like connecting people to other people who will get the job done for them. Mm -hmm. And when you had mentioned so something similar to that in marketing, it kind of appealed to me. Well, and from the discussion we had before, you're kind of you're kind of between a couple of a couple of thoughts as, as well. So yeah, I I almost see from the discussion we've had, I see you gravitating more toward 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 that that kind of area. All right. Well, this this at least gives you some things to look for and think about. They're all components of almost any company that, that you'll work for. So you'll have to understand those things no matter no matter what. So let's let's go on now and and let's let's take a look at a job description. And how you evaluate a job description is going to be pretty important. So I'd like you to go to page seven um, in, in uh, the, the career compass. And I want to take about, about five minutes on this. Maybe I'll give you a little bit more. I'd like you to read this very carefully because the questions I'm going to ask you about this afterwards is to tell me what kind of job this is. And I want you to think about from those five technical areas that you have that we, we did before, Think about places in the, in the job spec where it talks about where you might be using any of those five specific areas. All right, so who'd like to tell me a little bit about what you think you're reading in this, in this job spec? What's, what's this company about? Amy, it's in front of you, and go ahead and start. Well, I think um, one of the most frequent words used in this was validation. Mm -hmm. How many um, times was it used? A lot. I, <laughs> I didn't count, but a lot. Um, so that made me think that um, they're definitely interested in quality control and compliance. Mm -hmm. What kind of? Um, let's let, let pass. Just pass. Pass it down, and we'll see where where where, where she steps. Go ahead. And stop right there. So, what kind of company is this? Tell me a little bit about what you imagine the company is. Just give me an impression. What what kind of business are they in? Uh, doing some analytical chemistry things. They are, but fundamentally, what are their products? Or services, if you want to think of it that way, it's both. Who wants to take a crack at this? Validation. Of what? But yeah, but what's the what's the basic the business that they're in? I'm sorry. Pharmaceuticals. Could be, but but I, all right. So I'm, I'm I'll, I'll I'll quit playing with you. These are this is a filtration company. <clears throat> this is a filtration company, and in fact, it's a real company uh, called the, the Paul Corporation that in fact makes filters. And, and from the first paragraph, you can say they make see they make filters for a whole lot of different businesses. Some of them that are very specialty kinds of businesses that you can imagine you know, might have some very, very specialized kind of filtration needs. And so with all of that discussion about validation, what, what you might kind of get the, the guess is that, that, that they sell filters that have certain specifications. Those specifications may be required either by government regulations or, or by, by other outside agencies that, that those filters have to meet certain specs. And as a company, they've guaranteed that the filters will meet the specs. And somebody has to be in a position to, to prove that, in fact, that's, that, that's, that's what's happening. So that's maybe kind of what this, this job would, 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 would be about. So what kind of strengths would be important from, from what you're seeing? What kind of strengths of these five? What sorts of things, strings, things will be important for the successful candidate in this job? Communication, sure. There, there are places. And who would you be? Commu go ahead, grab the microphone, please. Uh, so for communication, because you have to communicate with the customer and mm -hmm. relate their needs to your uh, research team or manufacturing team, so that uh, you need to have the skills to understand what your customer needs and relate this to the technical people and vice versa. Correct. So this person is a Mr. or a Ms both inside and outside. You have responsibilities both places. And so in, in, in that spectrum that we looked at before, it might kind of be either in, in the product development area or kind of in the QA, QC sort of area, although, although less so that. I mean, there's, there's, there, you're absolutely right. There's a, there's a lot more interaction there. So what other skills might be required? We have communication. What, what else did you see that would be necessary? Technical skills. What kind? Um, analytical chemistry. Mm -hmm. And, and beyond the analytical chemistry, mm -hmm. you get the sense that there's going to be a fair amount of data handling mm -hmm. that, that's, that's going to have to be done because they, they specifically note that, that being proficient at databases 
would, would, would be important. Okay, so having had the opportunity to tear this apart, if you were then going to attempt to apply for this job, if you thought this is something that was in your wheelhouse and, you, and, 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 and met your strengths and, and your, your values, then can you see how taking what you've done with this job spec and noting that the word validation appears, I counted uh, 11 or 12 times, that, that that is important, how you would want to weave that into your cover letter, to your resume, to the way you characterize the things that, that you do, to write that to show that you have the capability to, to do what they're looking for, if in fact you do. Now, I'm not telling you to make up a story that you can't fill, but if, if this is a part of what you know how to do and you want the job, it's to your best advantage to read back to them what they gave you in the job spec, because that's, that's what they're gonna be looking for. Now, what, what we've drawn, done here is drawn those five technical skills on something of a hierarchy. So the communication skills are kind of the most, the most general skills. Everybody has, has to do those sorts of things. And, and team skills also also a pretty general. Um, while everybody has to have some management skills, you know, you, you, get, you advance a little bit in, in, in the organization, and, and, and perhaps that's a little more specialized kind of thing for your area. Leadership would be very uh, a bit more special in these, but where, where you really are, you know, you would you might not think of this. You might think of technical as being the most basic thing in a chemical company, but it's not necessarily, or science company, it's not necessarily true. It could be that the single most specialized thing that you have is, is, is your technical knowledge because of a particular niche that you that you mine. But I can guarantee you that the communication skills and team skills are something that needs to be common to everyone who walks in, in, in the door. Now, sometimes when you write a job spec, you may not do it with exactly these five, but you're gonna be asking yourselves, what, what are the basic skills that I need? So as an HR guy, you're gonna be, you're gonna be writing a job spec that says, what are the specific skills uh, that this successful candidate needs? And then how do I describe them? And you might, you might start from, from a bullet pointed list of things that, 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 that you think are important skills and then you might flesh them out a bit to say, here's why, here's the kinds of the kinds of, 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 of things that we want. So can you, uh, what I hope you take away from this is how important it is to spend some time and, and, and read the job spec forensically in order, in, in order to extract from it the most information that you can, not just about what they're looking for, but how you might characterize yourself to be able to take, it, to take advantage of that. Okay, let's, um, we have another one of these to, to, to practice on. By the way, there's one other thing I, I should note. Look on page eight before you, before you go on. So sometimes, sometimes you'll see language that you don't understand in a job spec. Sometimes it's there by accident because the company gets so used to talking about it. And sometimes it's there specifically to see if you have any idea what it is. So, so CGMP might be one of those one of those terms of art. Anybody know what CGMP is? Right, right. So, so if you if you know what that is, and you can feed back in your in your letter to be able to to demonstrate that you know what it is, it's it's yet another spark that you can use perhaps to distinguish yourself from from other people. Okay, let's go on then to page. Um, we've kind of we've kind of talked through uh, page uh, page nine for this job description, but what I'd like you to do is 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 to to do the do the following for pages ten and eleven. That's another job spec. I'd like you to to take what's in the job spec, tear it apart the same way. And then do the exercise um, on, on, on page nine, where at the bottom it says, if you were doing career coaching for a person who's applying for this position, what first of all, line out what kinds of, of skills might, might fall into those boxes and how a person applying for this job might either position himself or herself or strengthen the, their, their position in order to apply for it. So let's take about, let's take about five minutes on this. Okay, so taking a look back at, at the value chain, 
where in this continuum, or maybe down here, where would you say this job kind of lies? Where, where would you put it? Say again. It's uh, yeah, that, uh, that's probably. I'm guessing it's it's kind of right about in here, some some place, uh, a little bit of both. Now, is this an entry level position or an advanced position? Entry level, and it says and it says that straight up. What degree are they looking for? A master's degree. Okay. Now you notice that that. Um, well, what else? Tell me what else you observed in this. What what are some things that you that you found in this? Any observations you have about the language you read or the things that they were looking for? It's pretty vague. Um, it just essentially it wants someone who can run an experiment. They want someone who can uh, start with some data, make some conclusions. But it's very vague on actually what you will be doing in terms of what you'll be working with. So, so I'm looking at the and I'm looking at the second bullet, and it says. Employees in this, at, at this level independently evaluate, select, and apply standard scientific techniques, processes, and criteria that assess issues related to chemical products. So in a way, it's not so much that you're designing an experiment, but you're taking some sort of standard techniques and, 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 and doing testing with it. So it really, it's, I, when I do this and look at this, I don't see this as being an enormously creative kind of job. This is, this is a necessary job, not necessarily an enormously creative one. So did you see any language in here that you didn't understand? Q7A yeah, I was going to say, what the hell is a Q7A standard? And I, I don't know. I mean, I spent a half an hour Googling this once and didn't come up with what I found to be a satisfying answer. But it's very clear that this is, the, that this is a part of the industry that's very standards driven. Where, where it's, it's going to be important to comply with, with, with certain requirements. You're going to be doing standard tests to, to test that, that, that compliance. This is very much, I think, a compliance kind of job. So take a look through the, 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 the bullets for the tasks. You know, uh, let's, let's just kind of walk through them. Did, what, what, what's the first one? Where does, where does the first one fit in your, your five skills? Okay, there's there's some communication, there's some technical, there's there's there's, there's a bit of both there. Um, the second one, communication, and I'd also put that under under teamwork because you know it talks it, you know it talks about learning to to work to in both instruct and learn from production and project engineers. Okay, so the fact that you're going to be instructing and learning from Project engineers that says this job isn't that it's you know it's it's it, it's a bit different from, from that. <clears throat> okay, the next the next bullet where does that fall? Technical. It's it's technical, but it also once again it shows you that this is very much compliance oriented because it, it says work that involves conventional types of plans, surveys, and structures with relatively few complex features for which there are no precedents. In other words, it's pretty routine, but it has to be done right. Um, let's do just a couple of more of these. Um, the, the fourth bullet, perform initial uh, analysis and interpretation and so on. Yeah, pretty technical, pretty technical. But if you go down, um, I think where you see things like adhere to all safety and quality requirements, enhance site safety, I mean, that's, that's clearly a management Management kind of kind of kind of function um, may supervise subordinate personnel in their performance of research and general laboratory duties. Once again, is 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 is, is management. So you can see how you got different pieces of this. That, that 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 if you spend a little time with it, give you a picture of what this job looks like on on on, on a day to day basis, and you can decide whether you know whether you're interested in that kind of job or not. Now, the thing that I'd like to leave as, 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 as an exercise for you is to kind of go back to the five strengths that we talked about and think about this from your, from your own point of view as, as to where you're strong, where you're weak, where if, 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 if a balance of these sorts of things is going to be required of anyone, the kinds of things that you might want to be working on as you, as you prepare to get to the point for uh, applying for jobs. Um, there's something else that I'd like you to consider. We're not going to—I don't have the time to take you through the ChemIDP, 
but I would suggest that you have a look at it because what's in there is, is the opportunity to do a bit more extensive uh, evaluation of your values and your skills, to, to think about your job objectives, and also ChemIDP, just like any individual development plan, and there are a number of these, is, is meant to be a tool that if you use it, it, it organizes by telling it what you think you want to do and, and where you are, it can help you pick things that you might need to add to your portfolio um, in order to get to where you would like to be. It's only a tool, and it has to be, just like any tool, it has to be something that works for you. But it's something that, that might be worth looking at and, and taking a crack at least at, at, at the values and strengths part of it, because it does, that part of it matches up pretty well with what we've, we've talked about today. So let's think about where we've been um, in this, this second part of the process. We spent a fair amount of time with, with asking you to evaluate the kinds of things that were important to you as values, the kinds of things that you felt were, were your, your strengths and how they might match up with the kinds of strengths that, that would be asked for in, in, in various different kinds, kinds of jobs. Um, we talked a lot about how industry is structured and the kinds of things that, whether they are the first job that you ever have going into the industry or whether it's a job that you evolve into, the number of different things that, that can be done by people with a technical background in an industry, in an industry con context. We spent some time taking job specs apart. Now, these, these were not brilliant job specs. They were both sort of in the same area. But if you apply the same sort of discipline to, to jobs that you might be interested in, and you might practice this. You might, even if you're not looking for a job, go out and, and, and look at, at, at jobs that, that are advertised. You know, sometimes they'll be on you know, company websites. Just go to the website and, and, and look for the employment section. Pull a job spec a couple of different places and tear them apart just for practice to get an idea to see if, if, if you can determine what this, is, what this is really after. And if you wanted to go for it, how you would position yourself, what you would emphasize about the things that, that, that you do well in, in either writing, writing a cover letter or in rewriting your resume to, 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 to do that. And you can see then, we've, we've done these things in the opposite order of the way we usually do them, but you can sort of see how the output of what we've done this afternoon feeds into what we did this morning with, with, with um, the resume workshop as well. So I'll stop there. I'll thank you for your attention. And I'll ask you if you've got any other questions in, in, in general about these sorts of things and say, you know, if, you, if at some point you'd like somebody to look at your resume and, and, and review it and comment and, 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 you know, beat it back and forth a little bit, I'd be, happy, I'd be happy to do that. And I suppose I should give you my email address if that's the case. Janet always knows where to run me down. But this is probably the best. Sorry. These are young people. They have better eyes. <laughs> I don't know that I know how to write bigger. So it's wcarroll at indiana.edu. So there we go. Thanks very much. Thanks, Bill. So any questions? Please. And use the box. Um, so I've used IDP, uh, Chem IDP, a little bit. Um, could you guys provide the uh, the link to it, though? Um, sure. One of the things I noticed. Oops. Yeah, it's. Uh, oh, you know it. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just hard to find on the ACS website. Oh, I, I know, um, but it's also brand new. I mean, this okay. is this. We just yeah. had, we had it there for about a month, and it's still okay. kind of a work in progress. Okay. So you'll be a guinea pig. Is it, isn't it like chemidp.org? It's not. It, right it, it's exactly chemidp.org. I was just on there today. Okay, so once again, don't forget to fill out the, uh, the workshop evaluations. That determines how much I get paid. <laughs> Actually, it doesn't. I don't get paid a damn thing for this. <laughs> this is well, all part of the service. Yeah, I was going to say we could organize some kickbacks. For <laughs> <laughs> that's the case. Um, I think the word you were looking for is commission. Commission. Oh, commission. right, right. Commission. Go ahead. Yeah. Wait, hang on. Let's, let's throw this thing back. Throw the so box back. Uh, about the stability in, in 
the job world, like just going to industry. So I'm always worried about that. Like whenever I think about going to industry, I think like, you know, they give you a job to do and then at any any time if the project didn't work, did not work or something, they just let you go. So it can I, happen. It can happen. Um, if if it's 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 typically not as as mm -hmm. stark as that, but I won't tell you that it can't happen. Mm -hmm. But this is one of the things that you have to go back and look at your values. And 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 if you are extraordinarily risk averse, then it's entirely possible that that either industry or parts of industry want, might not be for you. Mm -hmm. But I'd also argue that 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 let's let let's compare to other places. Um, government can be more stable um, if you if you find if you find a job in government, mm -hmm. but there are advantages and disadvantages to to, to, to working in government. Mm -hmm. In government, the money is is typically not quite as good as it is in industry, but it's a hell of a lot better than it is in academe generally. At, but at the same at the same time, and you kind of know this a, a bit from from you know working in a national lab, although not so much. You know the. The white lines are, are pretty well defined in, in, in government. I mean, you know, I've, some of the people I've talked to, you know, the old the old line is stay in your lane, and and you know your your ability to do other things can be somewhat constricted by the way governments. On the other hand, maybe it's maybe it's more stable. So you kind of have to weigh those those things off against one another. And and I understand the reason you're asking the question. I can tell you that that that. The risk of being laid off is nowhere near as large as the perception of, of the risk of, 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 being, of being laid off. Other questions? Well, then, thanks again, thanks again for your time. I'll stick around if there's something you want to ask me. Ask me personally. I'm happy to do that. But thanks again for your Great. time. Great. We'll so. do a, little, a few minutes of office hours. Let's thank Bill again for thank his you. time and energy. My pleasure. Uh, for uh, I will re remind you and the folks online uh, of uh, the public talk tomorrow evening from 4 till 6, same place, same station, uh, and also available on link. Um, come and uh, rock out a little bit with Bill Carroll tomorrow night. Um, thanks again. Uh, please leave the um, uh, feedback forms on the top table. And uh, thanks for your time and your energy. Thank you.